We want to say welcome from Fresh Start. It's another beautiful day that the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We're so thankful for this opportunity to stand and do the will of the Father. We'll be in 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning, so if you would, turn with us within your Bibles and follow along in this Bible study. And while you're turning, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for this blessed day. We ask, Father, for your blessings upon the reading of the Word. We ask, Lord, that you would open eyes and open ears this morning, Lord. Allow this Word to fall on fertile ground. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we finished off in 2 Peter 1. The last two verses, we're going to recap those real quick. He said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, meaning that it is available for everyone to learn if you have that desire. He said, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we see many prophecies that were written down. And it was pinned down because of the Holy Spirit of God. It wasn't because of uh, the character or the person or anything of that nature. It was there to help you and I in this latter day. And Peter's going on to bring out something this morning. Now, verse 1 in chapter 2 is what this whole chapter 2 is about. So we're going to refer back to verse 1 a lot. So get a hold of verse 1 while we're on it. Verse number 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. It's prevalent that we see that there are false teachers out today. And this label comes upon somebody when they stand and profess the word of God. And when they try to profess God's word and they're going by what they have heard someone else say, instead of finding out in the scriptures exactly what God's word teaches us, they want to go by what they have heard. And so by bringing across the pulpit, bringing out in the Sunday school hours, bringing out in the messages these ideas that they have, these damnable heresies, they do it through ignorance. They do it because everyone else has done it for years. They do it because that's really all that they know. They do not know how to study the Word of God. They do not know how to define the words that are written in the Scriptures. And it's not that we are so brilliant of people that we're the only ones that can get it. And it's not a laughing matter. The situation is, is that people don't know the tools that it takes to study the Word of God. It takes defining what the words mean in the Greek. We are in the New Testament, so they used Greek in that day. So if you have a strong exhaustive concordance, you can look up these words and you can understand what he's saying now. That being said, listen to me here. He said, false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. These damnable heresies, think of the word. The word means that it brings damnation upon the people. What heresies are these? What are they talking about, Brother Randall? Well, when they come into the house of God and they want to start talking about Easter instead of the highest day of Christianity, which is Passover, and they want to insert different ideas into the subject that should be, the subject should be that Christ has become our Passover. He has become everything that you have need of. He shed blood all the 
way to the ascension. He has become everything that we need to take and allow a world through commercials and through advertisement and just the way the world is, to use that in a scripture is wrong. Not only that, but they'll go as far as to say that Christ, our Lord and Savior, your Lord, your Savior, they say that he was born on December the 25th. They say that it is his birth. For we know in Luke's gospel that it's not true, that that was the conception of the Holy Spirit. So we see that there is a deception in the world. There are false teachers. Everybody agree to that? Say amen. amen. There's false teachers in the world. And they're here to do it. Some do it through ignorance. But many have devised this because of the spirit that is in this world today. Satan's spirit. And they are preparing the way of their father. Why they do these things. Now, he said, <clears throat> damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them. Now, here's where it comes in. Here's where a man needs to do his homework. This word, Lord, in your strongs is 1203. 1203. And it means, it, the word is depostos. In other words, a husband. <laughs> so, he said that they are even denying their husband that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Not just the Lord. The word that Peter used in this scripture was the husband. You are what? You are the bride of Christ. You are to be doing what? Waiting uh, on the bridegroom, your husband. To come and deliver you. Amen? Amen. Woe unto them that are with child. And to give suck in those days. Amen. Why is that? Well, Mark 13, 17 says that. Amen. Woe unto them that are with child. And to them that give suck in those days. He's talking about if you are the bride of Christ. And when he comes spiritually. You are pregnated. That means that you have not waited on your groom to come. That you have been sleeping around with another. Spiritually, you are to wait on your husband. You are to wait on the true Christ. Is this being taught today? Is this coming across the pulpits this morning? I think not. I think they're already settled in their minds of an easy believism. A flyaway theory. A rapture doctrine. As we got into the Sunday school hour in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, it talks about how that he that shall let will let. Well, the secular church today wants to insert the word church into that. And they say that's where the church is called away. Well, that can only be the church. Well, no, friend, that's not talking about the church. He that shall let will let. That means the one who has hold on the chain. Revelations chapter 12 and verse 9. We're talking about Michael the archangel. He is the one who has hold. And when he lets loose, what happens? Satan stays up there in heaven and hangs out? No, friend, he's coming straight down here. Amen. Amen. All right, verse number 2. And many shall follow, excuse me, and many shall follow their pernicious way. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The way of truth shall be evil spoken of because of the way they teach. They do not want to teach you that you must hold out and you must wait until the true Christ comes. They want you to believe that there is a certain group that's just going to be called away. You know, they went as far as to even make a movie of this. Those in Hollywood grabbed a hold of it and said, Boy, I'll tell you what, that makes a good idea. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good movie. Let's make a movie of it. 
And they did. Left behind. And it's warped the minds of many good people. It's given them false hope. Because they have a, a desire to not want to study the Word of God. You see, when a person relies on a rapture theory, they no longer get into the Word of God. They no longer study God's Word. They no longer realize that they are Israel and that all of this is coming upon Israel and that how that they can separate themselves from this deception and from the destruction of the world. Even... Christians today believe that there is going to be a horrible thing happening during the tribulation. They think it's going to be a holocaust and it's going to be Armageddon. There's going to be wars and, and the world's going to be upside down. And Friend, that's the furthest thing from the idea of the Antichrist. The Antichrist doesn't want people to be afraid of him. The Antichrist wants people to love him. And to believe in him. And when he opens his purse, he wants to give out to everybody. And he'll have that ability. He's not out to destroy people. He's out to take their souls. A lot of people would think, well, you know, there would be people dying during that time. And he, he's going to kill people. No, that don't help him at all. Why would he want to kill somebody when Ecclesiastes 12 and 7 comes into play? For the Bible says that their soul goes straight to God. The spirit goes right back to God which made him. If he were to kill people during that time, he would lose, would he not? He wants people to be on his side and believe his ways. Verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. They don't care. They don't care how bad it hurts some people. They don't care. They want it to be taught. You know how bad they want it to be taught? They want it to be taught so bad that they send out quarterlies for you to go by, for people to go by. And it's their ideas, the way they scripture it out and put it together. If you've ever read any of these, you'll find that it's not exactly what the Word says. They'll twist it around a little bit. And when you hear, well, let's say the super preachers, when you listen to one of them on the radio or the television, and you are on the same hour, you can flip over and find another one. Wow, isn't it weird how they're all about the same message? Isn't it strange how all of them are following the strange message? Why is that? Because it has been piped down to do exactly what they say to do. And that's what it's called. He said they make merchandise of you. Do you know who the merchants are of this world today? Somebody. The Kenites. The Kenites. Amen, brother. The Kenites are those of the merchants. And they are the ones that's sending it down. Now, this word, feigned words, it's 4112 in your strongs. It's fictitious. In other words, it doesn't have any truth to it. None whatsoever. Again, who are we talking about? Verse 1. We're referring back to verse 1. He said, false prophets among the people. Okay. Verse number four. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. God did not spare these. For what reason? He's talking about those that came in through Genesis chapter six. Why did God not spare them? Well, I'll take you over here to John chapter 3 and I'll tell you why. John chapter 3 and verse number 3.
And Jesus answered Nicodemus and said unto him, Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. They had no desire to be born again. They had no desire to come through the womb of a woman. They wanted to come down and distort the bloodline that brought the Messiah. So they made their worst mistake at that point. When they came down, it says that God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Now this word hell, it's 50-20 in your strongs. And this word hell means the deepest abyss of Hades. That's where they are. That's where they are that have already came down and mated with women. Now, what happened to them? Well, everybody knows that there was a flood in that day, in Noah's day, and they were taken. And when their soul was taken, did God bring them up into paradise with him? No. The Bible says that he put them right there in the deepest abyss of Hades is where they are. You can find this over in Jude. Now, we're going to be going over to Jude quite a bit, so stick your finger in the book of Jude. Verse number 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And that's exactly what will happen. All right, back in 2 Peter 2 and verse 5. He said, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. This is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. And he's talking about here that the old world, He's talking about a time when people would not retain the Word of God. They did not have a desire to listen to God's Word or a preacher. <laughs> kind of like today. They did not want to listen to what a man has to say about God's Word. Now, again, we often say, don't take my word for it. You figure it out yourself. You study it along your own lines. I'm giving you some highlights, and if you're swift enough, you'll take some notes, and you'll go back and go over these things, and it will be ammo on your hip for when you need it. Does that make sense? Say amen. amen. That's what it's for. It's to help you and I. He said, uh, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Did you realize that there's going to be a flood coming in the day when the Antichrist is here? And he's not talking about a flood of water. It will be a flood of lies, Debbie. That's exactly right. And that's the way it will come. It will be lie after lie after lie. It will be so much lies that you won't know what the truth is unless you know. Amen? <laughs> Unless it is sealed in your mind. Unless you have it sealed in the forehead. Amen? All right, verse number six. <clears throat> and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with, with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. To those after that should live a wicked life. This wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not by chance that the English picked up the word from Sodom to describe this filth that they are doing. This sodomy. Verse 7, he said, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Lot had to sit and listen to the filthy conversations of these wicked. Now, these wicked had no desire of God's word or uh, just courtesy or uh, just love one for another. Friend, their minds 
were perverted. It was a fleshly perversion that they desired, and they spoke about it all the time. Meaning that's what Lot had to listen to. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how he felt having to be around that all of the time? It would be horrible to think that a true man of God would have to be around something like that. Well, welcome to 2020. It's very much in your face today. And it vexes the soul of a righteous man. It bothers a righteous woman. And it should. Verse number 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, we're not just talking about the conversations in this verse. We're talking about the deeds that they done. It was in the public. It was in their face. They were doing the ungodly deeds right there in front of Lot. And he seen this. Now, I'm throw something at you. The Bible says that when the angels came and got Lot, that the only ones that were delivered out of the city were Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. That's the only ones that made it out. Are you aware that Lot had sons? Are you aware that Lot had son-in-laws? It don't appear that everybody's with me on that one. Genesis chapter 19. Turn with me to Genesis 19 real quick. We're going to document this. I want to point something out. In verse number 12, 19 and 12. Genesis 19 and 12. The Bible says, And the men said unto Lot, Which men? The angelics. They came to deliver him. Hast there any besides? Question. Son-in-law? And thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Now, it's a sad thing to think that a righteous man had sons that were involved in this same perverted ideas. Not only his sons, but his sons-in-laws were perverted to a place of this. This perversion took them. Now, do you think that they were innocent and just got caught up in amongst all of that? I don't think so. Because I'm sure that Lot spoke with them and said, Sons, sons-in-laws, come with us. We have got to get out of here. Now what's the next verse say? For we will destroy this place because they cry of them the waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. 14. And Lot went out and spoke unto his sons-in-laws which married his daughters and said, Up, get ye out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. It's a sad thing to know that your family won't listen. It's a sad thing to know that your loved ones won't listen. But that happened a lot. It truly did. Back in 2 Peter 2, in verse number 9, listen to this. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve unto the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. 
God does know how to deliver the godly out of temptations. As in Noah, Lot, the Israelites, God has delivered His people. And He's been a good God to His people. Verse 10, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Again, while you've got your finger in Jude, run back over to Jude, verse number 8. It said, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Do you see that happening today? Oh yeah. It's all over. You can see it. There ever been a place and a time when somebody would talk so bad about the government that we have or talk so bad about the officials that we have. Never a time have we ever seen disrespectful people being so disrespectful to those holding a position that God honors. You see, government is orchestrated by God. When you go against the government, you go against God. God placed the government there for a reason. These people that are in office are there for a reason. To do the will of the Father. Back in 2 Peter, verse 11. Keeping your finger in Jude. He said, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, Bring not railing accusations against them before the Lord. Turn over to Jude, verse 9. Verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, Drust not bring against him a railing accusation, but saith, The Lord rebuke thee. That is the same thing that you and I need to remember when we're confronted in this latter day of these angelics. You will not be able to wrestle with them. You will not be able to convert them. You will not be able to help them. The only thing you can say is the Lord rebuke thee. And they will know their place. Back in 2 Peter, verse 12. <laughs> but these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, again, who are we talking about? Verse 1, the false prophets. We're talking about these prophets that Speak evil of the things that they understand not. How many times and how many places have we brought out that the Word of God says that we are to weigh upon the Lord? That we are to be steadfast, unmovable, endure to the end, wait upon God. They speak evil against our Lord because they give out false hope. Ezekiel chapter 13. And God prophesied against that. So I've never heard that uh, God's against the rapture. Never seen the word rapture in the Bible, but I didn't know God was against it. Well, you need to read more of the word of God. You need to be more familiar with God's word and realize that God doesn't like it. When you feel the minds of the people, listen to me. God's people are like sheep. God expects his sheep to be fed. And when you feed them fake news or fake information or lies, God doesn't like it. He's unhappy with it. It's not something that helps the people. Verse 13. 
and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. And they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. <laughs> he said, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. While they feed with you. This spots that he's talking about. It's documented in Deuteronomy chapter 32 exactly what he's saying. Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 3. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Verse 5, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and crooked in their generation. This word spot is talking about their teachings. <clears throat> their teachings are not our teachings. Their spots are not our spots. It's not the same. Back in, uh, excuse me, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 13, he said, <clears throat> spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Turn with me into Jude. Jude, verse 12. What's it say there? <laughs> there? These are spots in your feasts of charity. In other words, these are spots in your studies of love. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees without fruit, withered, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Verse 13, raving waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. This is what is already judged to these people. This is what false teaching will do. This is what falseness will happen in a person's life when they don't try to get a hold of the truth, the true word of God. And Peter's talked about it time and time again. And it's a sad thing when people don't want to recognize God's word. When they don't want to study out for themselves. Back in 2 Peter verse 14, he said, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls. A heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Now we've talked about how that you are to dissect these words. And you are to take this, the scriptures, and to closely follow along with it. And that's what I've done. In this scripture, verse 14, he said, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling. This word beguiling in your strongs is 1185 and it's in, to entice just as Eve was beguiled by the serpent. It is to be wholly seduced 
And it says, unstable souls. And heart they have exercise. This word exercise is really shocked me when I brought this one. <laughs> this is 1128 in your Strong's. And it says to practice naked in the game. You can add to that what you like. He said here, with covetous practices. This covetous practices in your strongs is 41-42, and it's shipping merchandise. And this cursed children are none other but the cursed ones. What did God tell Cain, in Genesis, he said, Cursed art they. Cursed are you. And his offspring are cursed right along with him. So we see here that Peter is trying to really open our eyes to understand that we, if we're not careful, God's children can be beguiled. And that they are going to do all they can in their covetous practices, in their shipping of merchandise. And they do it in a fashion that's not pleasing unto God, in no manner, form, or fashion. Verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. 16, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. In Numbers chapter 22, you can start seeing where God what happened to Bo what happened to Balaam? He began to take God's word and use it for merchandise. He took God's word and was paid for it. He went long and far to do what he thought was right for filthy lucre, for the money. Well, God told him to do what? If you've ever read the story, God said, don't go unless I tell thee. Well, lo and behold, he had a dream. It wasn't God, but he had a dream. And the next morning, what did he do? He jumped on his donkey and he headed out right where he should not go. Now the Bible says that the angel of the Lord stood before him. Anybody know who the angel of the Lord is? It's the Lord himself. And the Bible goes as far as to say, uh, that verse 16 he said, but was rebuked for his iniquity. Let's just turn over there real quick. Numbers 24. Numbers chapter 24 real quick. I want you to see this. Numbers 24, I'll start reading in verse 15. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Boar, he said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said. He has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but his eyes were open. <laughs> He's listening. His eyes were open, you see. 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do 
valiantly. And out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth in the city. That's why Peter has brought out this in 2 Peter. Back in 2 Peter verse 16, he said, but was rebuked for his iniquity. And now God had to go as far as to use a donkey. Balaam he began to have a conversation with this donkey. The donkey sat down right before, and what did Balaam do? Well, he got out his stick and began to beat that donkey. And the donkey turned around to him and said, Why are you beating me? He said, Have I not always been your donkey? Have I not always provided you transportation since I began to be rode upon, more or less? And he was disputing the situation between him and the donkey. Now, when God allows deception to come into a person's mind, they do this because it's what they want. And God will allow it. You see how confusing these false prophets can be? They have no desire to follow God, but yet they'll talk to a donkey which makes no sense whatsoever. Did he not realize that it was God allowing that donkey to speak? But eventually, he opened his eyes. Back in 2 Peter 2, verse 17, he said, These are wells without water. Now, what is a well without water? Nothing more than a hole in the ground, is it? And if you ain't careful, your life will stumble right off into that hole. Just an old, dark, deep hole with nothing in it. That's what they are. That's what Peter's trying to tell you this morning. He said, clouds they are with a tempest. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They're deceivers of the worst kind. And they are why, these are why we have Amos 8 and 11 today. These are the reasons why we have 8 and 11 in the book of Amos today. He said that there will be a famine in the land, not of bread and water, but of hearing of the word of God. That's why we have it today. And that is the reasoning. Does that famine affect you? It doesn't have to. You can overcome this famine. You can overcome and take of the bread of life freely. You can come and drink out of that well. Jacob's well, the one this little Samaritan woman was sitting there, you remember that well? Jesus said, if you take of this water, you'll never thirst again. He wasn't talking about Jacob's well. He was talking about him. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. That's the truth. That's exactly what is set aside for them. Verse 18. For when they shall speak great swelling words of vanity. This words of vanity, this is emptiness. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same, he is brought in bondage. In other words, they bring them to the point of salvation. They teach them about Jesus Christ and His saving power but they never teach them any further. That's what he's saying here. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. They're the servants of corruption because they do not teach the true word of God. Do you see the... Well, just how strong 
God is against false teaching, it's very important that it's taught the right way so that God's little children are not deceived, so that they're not led astray. What did Christ tell Peter? He said, feed my lambs. Then he said, feed my sheep. And then a third time he said, feed my sheep. God's people need to be fed. They need to be fed the truth. When a person comes to the house of God, they normally plant themselves inside God's house if they're comfortable. And they will be fed by the ministry, by the teaching in the Sunday school hours, and through the ministry. And then once they are fed, well, it seems as if it is right in the person to tithe to that church. And when they tithe to that church, they are being a part of that ministry. I said that to say this, be sure that your teachers are teaching the truth. Where you are being taught, if you are tithing and you are giving offerings and love offerings for say, be sure that you are being taught the true word of God and not a lie. Because you can be held just as much accountable for participating in that ministry. Verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. And we see that. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. <laughs> Did that make sense to you just then? That one that led you to the Lord could very well be the one that can place you in bondage because of the untruth that he teaches, because of the things of the world, the traditions of man he likes to teach. Verse 20, For if after they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. I'm going to turn over here to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. Verse 43 says, this is Christ speaking. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. In other words, when you get saved by the grace of God, he said, the unclean spirits are gone out of that man or that woman, no longer doing what they've done. He walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Now, had he relied on his Savior and relied on Jesus Christ, Christ would give him peace and rest, would he not? Amen. Amen. Verse 44, Then he saith, I will return to my house from whence I came out, and when he come, when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. No longer are those evil spirits there. But, listen to the latter end. Verse 45, Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also to this wicked generation. When they come to the knowledge of the truth through salvation... They gain it. They latch on to it. Why is that? Well, it's this mostly, is that you cannot pervert the salvation of the Lord. Christ is the one that does the saving. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's not you that goes looking for God. It's not you that goes looking for Jesus. It's not you that has a desire to go get saved. It's the Spirit of God, that Holy Spirit, when it beckons unto 
your heart, that's God speaking to you and knocking at your door and wanting you to open up. So it's Christ that does the saving. You can't pervert that. But he says here, for if after they escape the pollutions of the world, I'm back in 2 Peter 20, chapter 2, verse 20. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in other words, after getting saved, they are again entangled therein and overcome. What does that mean? That means that they are not in a place that's teaching them to go forward. They're still on the milk and they do not understand God's Word. They do not understand what's going to happen in the near future. They are the five virgins in Matthew 25 that are unwise. They do not have enough oil in their lamps. The oil is the Word of God. They do not have enough understanding. All right? He said here, he said, and the latter end is worse to them than the beginning. You know what? Being saved wasn't the best thing for them people. Because it says that the latter end, when they did not wait upon the Lord, and they believed in a rapture theory and any type of a, a hoodoo coming down the pike, the worse will fall upon them. You see, many today, they come to know Christ as their Savior. Jesus does the saving, but they entertain all kinds of crazy things inside their worship. They allow anything, and it's not of God. That's why God said, He said, the latter end is going to be worse for them. Verse 21 for it had been better for them to not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. The holy which which commandment? The holy commandment. He's talking about the entire word of God. To turn away from the word of God. They do not listen to the word of God. They would soon listen to somebody coming in out of a long country and come and preach revival to them and give that man all sorts of money, and they didn't more or less get anything out of the messages. They never understood anything other than a salvation message. And 95% of them are sitting there saying, well, darn, I got all dressed up and come all the way over here to hear this all week long, and it's the same thing that I knew. It's the same thing. I didn't get taught anything. Verse 22, come to a close. He said, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. This is a strong picture that Peter is presenting before you. If any of you have ever witnessed anything like this, you do all you can to close your eyes and turn your head. You do not want to see this animal filling his belly up with something that he had brought out of his belly. It's disgusting. He said, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Meaning that she was cleaned up. I've said this before, you can take an old sow and you can take some Tide and you can wash that sow, boy, I mean, take a good brush and scrub it and clean it. Take you some of that Chanel number no. 5 and put on it. And it's still just a hog. Okay? The sad part about it is there's a lot of people in the same concept. Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to go there and we'll come to a close. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Listen to me and listen to me very strongly. I want you to have good ears when you hear this. Verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Anybody know what the will of the Father is? Study his word. 
Jesus said, Lo, I come to you in the volume of this book. Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. You lift up Christ in your heart and your mind every time you open up the Word. 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wondrous works? They did it. They did it. But it was through man's ideas, but not of God. 23, and then thou wilt profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye work of iniquity. Ye that work iniquity. That work the wickedness. God did not expect his children to sit on a seat of do nothing. God's children are can-do people. They are people that will learn. They are people that will have a desire to learn. And they are people that will overcome. God expects you to be an overcomer. Peter, you know, I, I know it sounds strong and, and, and kind of dogmatic and things. And, and you say, well, golly, Brother Randall, it's, it's always something real strong in the message. Take it up with Peter. It's not me. I'm telling you what the scriptures say. I want to bring across the point, this being that we've got to study so that you're not confused on how these things are going to transpire in the latter days. There's going to be a great army that's going to come. And they're going to be orchestrated by Satan but designed by God. God will be in control. But it would be up to you, individually, to decide whether or not you take part in that type of belief. This end time will not be a time when you have to carry a pistol and a sword and a grenade and all kinds of... It will be a spiritual warfare. It will be what is in your mind. What do you believe? You're getting a small foretaste of it today. You're getting a small foretaste of it today. You can look around and see individuals that are participating in something and some that do not believe in something. It depends on which side you're on. That's what God expects you to do. To be on the correct side and understand that God is not going to force something upon you. He's going to allow you to make your own decision. That's why you have what's called free will. The Bible says that God would that none would perish. But all would come to what? Repentance. Come to repentance. A change of heart. A change of mind. And have a desire to please God. Not man. What did the first verse say? There were false prophets. And also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Be aware of that. That's what Peter's trying to say. All right, that's Second Peter chapter 2. Next week we'll be in chapter 3. Looking forward to chapter 3. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless.